Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm AJ, and I am a first year Tepper student, MBA student here at Tepper. And I am here to gladly introduce you to one of our very own, Susan. <laughs> she is also a Tepper alum, uh, also the co-founder and uh, chief creative officer yep. of ModCloth. ModCloth, as you may know already, is an online retail store uh, that offers distinctly feminine and uh, vintage-inspired clothing. Clearly, as you can tell, I shop there every day. Um, <laughs> but I did go online and I checked out uh, Susan's video where she uh, walks uh, her audience uh, through her personal collection and closet. And I gotta say, Susan, I while watching that video, I realized that your closet is exactly the opposite of my closet. <laughs> Not just in terms of style, but also in terms of cleanliness and organization. <laughs> uh, so Susan here is to uh, is going to share an amazing story uh, about herself, uh, a story that also involves another Tepper alum and a sports fellow, and, um, and a story that uh, is about taking a lifelong passion and uh, transforming it into a successful business. So without further ado. Right. Thank Susan. you. Thank you so much. Right. <laughs> We're, we're so fortunate to have Susan here with us today. Uh, she's built an amazing business um, that we'll talk a lot about today, but uh, Susan and her husband, Eric, have given a lot back to CMU over the years. Uh, they've hosted our students when they've come out on treks. Uh, they've hired students. Uh, they've always been willing to give back in very various ways. And uh, I think that's what really makes Carnegie Mellon a special place, is that people have great experiences here, and they stay involved um, with, with the university for a long time. So let's give a special round of applause for Susan. Thanks. And, and they have a pop-up store that's in action right now, yep. downtown 625 Smithfield Street. That's so right. If you're uh, interested in coming downtown and interacting with uh, the products that they have, I think it's a great uh, opportunity. When will you, how long will it be up? We're there till the 27th, and we have some discount cards in the back. So definitely grab <laughs> one of those. Yeah. Yep. Very, very cool. <laughs> Well, cool. So, um, you know, I, I think it's always great to hear a founder describe their company in their own words. So, Susan, give us the elevator pitch for what ModCloth means to you. <laughs> so, ModCloth is a digitally native lifestyle brand that sells distinctly feminine and vintage inspired fashion and home decor, um, including our signature line, um, which we launched just about a year ago. Um, we're really well known for having a community of customers that are super passionate about what we do and that engage with the brand. So when you shop on ModCloth, you'll see photos of our customers wearing the products, like really detailed ratings and reviews that can help you find the right fit. Um, we're also well known for having a full range of sizes. So our ModCloth signature line is available in extra, extra small to 4X. Um, and we are starting to kind of test the waters and bring ModCloth to um, IRL, which we're doing here in Pittsburgh this month, which is super exciting. Did you hear how good that elevator pitch was, students? How practiced she was? <laughs> um, actually, we're going to uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions uh, about 20, 25 minutes in. But I'm going to sort of get Susan warmed up so then you guys can come in with the good zingers, all right? Um, so the amazing thing about ModCloth is you actually started it before you came to Carnegie Mellon. Yep, right? technically, so, yeah. yeah so <laughs> tell us how it all got started. Why, where, you know? Yeah, so um, I'm a Florida girl. I grew up in South Florida. Um, my, I've always loved fashion and I've always kind of had an appreciation for it. Um, some of my earliest memories are like playing dress up in my grandma's basement. Like I've just kind of always loved the self-expression that comes with getting dressed every day. Um, and I kind of always had an eye for it too. Um, Growing up, I didn't have a ton of disposable income, so I kind of turned to thrift stores and like my mom and my grandma would take me vintage shopping at thrift stores and I just found it was a cool way to, um, you know, find things that were unique and that felt different than everyone else. 
Um, when I got into Carnegie Mellon, I realized that I had to buy a whole new wardrobe. Um, I literally had like, I think I'd seen snow once before I came here. <laughs> Um, so I was in for in for a treat, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I basically had to buy like scarves and sweaters, and you know I don't have to tell you guys, you know, what you need to live here in Pittsburgh. Um, it's not that bad. Come on. No, no. Well, Every compared day is to like today, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, compared to you know living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, though, where it's like you know, I, and I don't I, the humidity. I don't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I basically had to buy a whole new wardrobe and I never really looked at the winter wear in the thrift stores before and I started realizing that there was all this amazing stuff. Um, and I've just, I was never able to like pass up something beautiful on the rack. You know, I'd find like, wow, this is like a gorgeous wool coat from the 1960s and it's in perfect condition and it's four dollars and I have to buy it even if it doesn't fit me. Like I will <laughs> find some use for it. Um, my boyfriend at the time, Eric, um, who also came to CMU and ended up getting, doing the 3-2 program here, he was a Swartz Fellow, um, he had started a web hosting and web development business in high school with two of his friends, so he had designed a few e-commerce sites. This was 2001, 2002, so basically they were like, kind of like the... I think I can say this because we've been married for 10 yeah. years now. They're like the nerdy kids yeah, who were like, hey. Nerds well, roll at CMU. I, oh, of course, yeah. No, but he was like, um, him and his friends were like, hey, guys, like going to local business owners, like it's time that you guys get on that internet. We can help you. Um, <laughs> right? Like that was the time that it was. It was kind of crazy. Um, so he actually had the idea that I start a website and try to sell some of these great things that I was finding that, you know, ended up kind of just going from the thrift store and then sitting in my closet because I didn't have anything to do with them. Um, and I love that idea. It seemed like you know, I'd already gotten into school. I had kind of the summer after I graduated from high school before I came up here. Um, it seemed like a fun thing to learn. So I kind of sat down and started teaching myself a little bit of Photoshop. And <coughs> I think I used like Microsoft front page or something like that to what hack. That? Does that exist? Yeah, probably not anymore. <laughs> but yeah, just like kind of started hacking the, the, the shopping cart. We used like a interchange, which is like a free open source shopping cart. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, thinking back, it's crazy. Like it's 2002 is before Etsy, like eBay was a possibility but right. you know like it was right. you kind of had to like build it from scratch yeah. um you know it was before the iphone which yeah. is just nuts because now Absolutely. it's like more than half of our traffic comes through mobile yeah. and you know sales are like almost there too and it's yeah it's just wild so that's that's how the idea got started and it was very very small it was something that i did part-time while i was an undergraduate here um and as you guys know like you don't anything that you're doing part-time at CMU. You don't have yeah. a ton of time to do it. Um, and yeah, it's it just, it's something that I, I love to do. And basically every time I sold an item, it meant that I got to go out and buy new items, which was always my favorite part. Um, and yeah, it's I, I was very fortunate to be able to kind of be at Carnegie Mellon and be able to spend time working on the business while I was here to get mentorship from um, various people across the program to, you know, really learn about my customer, to learn about my business, to test and sort of be in an environment where I didn't have to, the business didn't need to like fully support me right. in those early years. Right. Yeah, and, and Eric. So Eric was cranking along yep. getting other customers, but also helping you. Yeah. Were you the priority? <laughs> well, I hope so, um, but I wasn't paying anything, so yeah. probably not. <laughs> but, he, but he went snuggling. It, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so what, uh, you, you talked about sort of working part-time at Carnegie Mellon. Does anything stand out in your mind that really helped accelerate the business and change the way you thought about the business while you were here? Yeah, I had a um, independent study with uh, Professor Culbertson, and we I spent time that semester, I think it was my junior year, um, working on the business and kind of getting to meet with him every week and like talking about um, what was going on. And, you know, I remember we sat down and we were looking at our traffic and at that point, like we'd built, um, we'd done a pretty good job of like architecting our product descriptions to have like SEO, um, like search engine optimized keywords and we'd started to get um, a decent bit of organic traffic. And I think we had something like 70,000 unique visitors coming to the website a month at that point. 
Um, and I remember sitting down and he was like, you know, look, Susan, like this is something you really love. Like if you had a store in Pittsburgh, you wouldn't have 70,000 unique people walking in every month. Um, that's something there. And there's probably a way to better monetize that traffic. Like you need to think about your business model and, and really, you know, consider like, like this thing feels like it could grow, really consider whether it can. Um, and being able to like have that conversation and um, you know kind of have the validation of right. like someone who looked at lots of different business ideas say like hey there might be something here um, definitely gave me more confidence to really sit down and say like okay if I were to try to make this work to support me to be something that I do after graduation like how can I make that I happen? I have to go get a real job? I can <laughs> work on what I love? Yeah. So, so what 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 did that advice and, and confidence builder turn into action? What, what did you do next? Yeah, so it turned into really thinking about how the business model could scale. And so when you're buying one of a kind vintage, everything comes in one color and it comes in one size and it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the best customer experience. Um, and from a business perspective, you're putting in all of that work to each item, right? So it doesn't, doesn't really scale. Um, so I literally sat down and I kind of Googled like, how do I find wholesale clothing? Like, how do I buy? I used to go to the mall and like look up all the tags and try to Google them and like figure out how to get to them. Um, but it, it ultimately led to like looking up uh, fashion trade shows, going and finding independent designers, like kind of going out and finding um, like small run production uh, designers that were able to kind of bring a similar look and feel mm -hmm. to the cool one of a kind vintage that I was finding and really starting to build a scalable inventory. Okay. Um, that was in like 2005, 2006 as I was approaching graduation and really starting to think about um, being able to scale and, and do this full time. Right, so this wasn't just an individual decision. You were still dating Eric, things were yep. going well, and neither of you had a real job. Like, what, <laughs> what happened when you graduated that allowed you to continue to work on Mod Cloth? Yeah, being able to, so Eric stayed an extra year and got his MBA, so we were able to kind of coast off of those student loans for a little yeah. longer, which definitely helped. Being here in Pittsburgh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really low cost of living. Like, I think about, um, what we did here, I don't think we would have been able to do in a place like New York or LA, even though that seems more, um, it's, you know, they're, they're bigger fashion capitals, yeah. obviously, but, you know, being able to live here and be really thrifty and like make a little go a long way, um, be scrappy. I feel like we, we got our scrappy badge then for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, and I was able to, when I graduated in 2006, I was able to go out and find these independent designers, start to bring in um, more and more renewable inventory um, versus the one of a kind vintage. Um, I hired a few part-time employees to help me with customer care and with packing orders. Um, we bought this like crazy house in uh, Friendship that we like ran the business out of the garage and or out of the garage and out of the basement. And, just was like kind of nuts. So by the time Eric finished with his MBA, um, I had the business um, kind of churning and getting to a place where he could um, join. And like, right. we weren't able to really pay ourselves anything, yeah. but we were able to at least work on it together and keep it going. Right. So you, you raised a little bit of money. And we raised some friends and family money, yeah. Okay. And then ultimately Innovation Works got involved. Yeah, Innovation Works joined in our first round in 2008. 2008. Um, so 2008 was the first time we, it's a big year for us, we moved into our first official office, which is really big, like getting out of the house and out of the basement was amazing, <laughs> as you guys can imagine. Um, yeah, we raised uh, through Innovation Works, and um, First Round Capital was the leader of that round. They're based in um, Philadelphia, but also they have offices on the West Coast as yeah. well. Yeah, we uh, we just created a relationship with First Round and their dorm room funds. So oh, been, cool! That's great. Invested in two, two of the startups here. So that's awesome. So you, yeah, um, they're amazing. They're yeah. such good partners, and right. they really helped us incredibly. And you guys hired a bunch of other CMU alums that were your classmates and things yeah. you know, to do that. That was really cool. Like a deal. And Eric and, yep. and those are the ones I know well. But you ultimately, you, know, you have offices in San Francisco, LA, here in like Crafton, like yep. hundreds of employees. People don't know that Mod Cloth here, which is a great story. But you moved to San Francisco. What what happened there? Why did you guys move to San Francisco? Yeah, so we'd um, raised two rounds of funding. Um, we were growing really quickly. I think we had something like 
600% year-over-year growth from 2009 Ooh. to the 2010. That's awesome. Yeah, we were getting to a point where the business was really scaling and we needed to um, build a team of people who had worked on fast-scaling e-commerce companies. Um, our investors recommended San Francisco because they were based there and they were like, we have this network here, we can help you. Um, it seemed like the place to go to really continue to scale that team and to find people that could help us um, in, help us like kind of look around. You can never look around corners, but help us kind of see what was coming. Um, and for, I was traveling basically every month, every other week or so going out to LA to buy because the fashion district is in LA. A lot of the designers we work with are there. Um, so when we moved, when we relocated in 2010, um, we opened offices in San Francisco and in LA. Um, and that's kind of how we have the business set up today where our design and buying um, offices are down in Los Angeles. So that's where I'm based full time now. Um, San Francisco is our headquarters. Our like CMO sits there, our CFO sits there. Um, and then Pittsburgh is our, we're kind of like, we're, we have basically every team has some people in all three locations, but in Pittsburgh, it's um, mainly our fulfillment center here. Our great customer care team is here. Um, we do all of our product photography here as well. We have tech team here. Um, so yeah, it's oh, been, great. yeah. It's also but I, I do have to say like, when for any entrepreneur, like as soon as you kind of get to the point where you're not able to get everyone into the same room, like the complexity just oh, goes through the roof. Yeah, it's really, yeah, absolutely, it's, right. yeah, it's hard. It sometimes happens when, <laughs> you're, when you're in the basement and the garage together. Totally. Right? Yeah. Um, so the CMU network actually came to bear in sort of getting that scaling capital and access to talent. Jim Schwartz's firm, Axel Partners, was the lead in that round to yep. I think. You know, and uh, so uh, those of you who don't know, Jim Schwartz uh, just uh, gave a gift of $31 million last year to create the Schwartz Center for Entrepreneurship. So I think we're at a, a really interesting point in time at CMU where, where things are going to grow. Back in your elevator pitch, you talked about how you engage your customers and your community. And I think that's one of the really cool differentiators about Mod Cloth. And I think many of you tried to emulate what you've done. Tell us about what that means. How do you engage your customers and your community? Thanks. Yeah, and I think for me, it's always been kind of an intuitive thing. Like I, I don't, as much as, you know, I've done this for, gosh, 14 years now, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> um, I, I never like felt like a fashion insider and but I still had like a good eye for it and I still really loved it and was very passionate about it and I kind of always had the sense of like okay if I feel this way I think our customers probably feel this way too so I want to give them the chance to be part of what we're doing here um, and I think that I think where it's like what we've really become known for is giving our community a platform to not just engage with us as a brand in the ways that and we were very early in doing that on Facebook and like you know all the and part of that was just timing mm -hmm. you know we were like we were one of the first fashion brands on Facebook because I was a student at the time and I was like wow if my brand's on Facebook like my or if I'm on Facebook then my brand has to be on Facebook too um, but we've not only given our community a chance to like interact with us as a brand, but we've given them the chance to interact with each other. And like we do that through like our style gallery where our customers upload photos and love photos and, um, you know, kind of help to merchandise our site and like bring the products to life. Um, I think that is and like that's it's enabled by technology, but it's also it's very human. And part of it is like, you know, we have an incredible organization of people that you know, think about responding to every, you know, single inquiry that we get in a personal way and like have empathy and like actually like deal on a, as much as like technology enables us to um, kind of talk one to many, like it's those like personal connections that really matter. And that, you know, at the end of the day, when someone's wearing a mod cloth I am and someone says like, oh, that's so cool, where'd you get that? Like it makes them like that, like one to one is I think what's really helped us to to yeah. grow and to expand. It's really important. The customer voice is at the table every yep. day for every decision you make. That, that's really unique. That doesn't happen all the time, so you keep keep going with that. You know, being an entrepreneur is a series of high highs and low lows, right? And, you know, tell us about one of the low lows that you had and how you dealt with it, right? Yeah, it's really, I'm, it's so true. Um, I mean, it's, 
it's kind of cliche, but everyone says like entrepreneurship's a roller coaster ride, and it it is so true. Like you'll have kind of the highest high to you know the next day you're like, oh god, this is happening again. <laughs> yeah. No, I always say it's like. 30 days out of, you know, with my job, it's like 30 days out of the month, 29 of them, I'm so excited and I'm like, feel so lucky to get to do what I do. And then there's one day where I'm just like, fuck, who put me in charge? You know, honestly, <laughs> like, it's like, oh, come on. Um, yeah, like that's, that's how it goes. Um, we've been through, we've been through a lot at ModCloth and every business has, um, I definitely, I, so I highly recommend um, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, yeah. Ben Horowitz's, ben Horowitz's book, yeah. book. It's so key. Um, and he talks a lot in that book about uh, kind of being, being straightforward and I think being like, he doesn't use the word vulnerable, but that's the mm -hmm. word that I took out of it. Um, I think like when you have those tough times, you have to be yeah, you, you have to be willing to, to talk about it and to put yourself out there and to kind of like lean on your team and lean on um, you know, your, your mentors and your advisors and the people that, that help you. And you have to right. be, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it wouldn't be fair to talk about just low lows. Like sometimes you get those <laughs> high highs and you feel like you're killing it, right? So yeah. what was one of those moments for you? I, every time I see someone wearing mod cloth like in the wild, like someone that is not really, so, <laughs> someone that I saw a dinosaur yeah. dress up yeah. here. <laughs> to someone who's like not related to me, who knows about mod cloth, I'm just like, whoa, that's so cool. Um, I still get, I still really <coughs> geek out on that. It's amazing, um, and it, I, I hope will never ever get old. But yeah, now that we we actually design products in house as well, like getting to see someone who's wearing something that, um, you know, that, that my team had a hand in yeah. creating the print or, you know, creating the fit. Like it's, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. And it, it blows my mind every time. That's amazing. You said 14 years, you had that founder, a problem fit, and today you're still excited about it. That's amazing. So <laughs> let, let's look out into the future. What, what do the next five years hold for ModCloth? What do you see happening and changing? Yeah, so we're really excited to be testing the mod cloth concept in IRL and in real life. Um, I think that, you know, as much as, and today's been awesome, like I walked across campus today, it's the first time I have done that in a long time. I was just like, wow, this is, it's so nostalgic, it's so pretty, it's so beautiful being here. Um, and I, I really had to remind myself to like, take a moment to like appreciate, like we've come a long way. I still feel like we're so tiny and we have such a, a long way to go. Like fashion's a huge industry, yeah. mod cloth's growing a lot, but we're still like a tiny little right. fish in the sea. Um, so thinking about, you know, really bringing the mod cloth brand to um, more people, doing that through, um, you know, continuing to grow online, but also bringing her um, an experience that she can come and interact with us, interact with each other, and like actually get to see the products. And like, we get to learn so much from that. It's really exciting. Like we get to learn about fit. We get to learn about right. like construction and just like getting to see our customers right. in the clothes this in is person. Really interesting. You started off online, but you're evolving to yeah. IRL. You're doing these pop-ups. Do you yep. see uh, having permanent stores ever? We would love to do that. And we're, yeah, we're like hard at work. We have nothing official yet, but um, yeah, we've just, we've seen such an incredible response from our community to the IRLs. We've done five of them across the country this yeah. year. Um, and it's, it's really exciting to think about like how we can um, take the experience to the next level and do it in a way, I mean, it, it does kind of, it, it is kind of funny, right? Cause it's like, I'll, traditional retail is moving from brick and mortar to online and has been for, you know, yeah. 20 years, right? But taking the, being a digitally native brand like we are and moving that to a um, physical experience and thinking about how we can do it differently. Like we have a fit and ship model where you come in and you get to work with a mod stylist if you want to, she can take your measurements, she can help you. Um, with like, you know, if you're thinking about if you have a specific occasion that you have in mind for that you're shopping, like they can help you kind of style your look with items that you already have in your closet, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it enables us to, um, you know, carry a lot more inventory. Yeah. It enables us to carry all the sizes, not have to worry about um, things breaking, having right. a bad customer experience, having to, you know, put things on sale that we wouldn't otherwise because we just have one uh, size left, like right. that kind of thing. Both words. You have that 
physical yeah. in-person experience, but you got the long tail of you can deliver anything. Is yep. there anybody any doing the mod fit at the pop-up store? Yep. Oh, awesome. So, yep. So check that out. So let's open it up to questions uh, from from the students, faculty, community members that are here. Yeah. Hi, Susan. My name is Rachel Trubis. Hi. I'm a first year pepper student here. Um, I come from retail too, and I'm a personal shopper at your site. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Used to be a vintage shopper as well, so I think that's cool. brought me to your site. Um, you were referencing a little bit about being the design district and going out and shopping and finding smaller vendors. Um, but I think if I heard you correctly, you were also talking about you have in house designers creating your own. Can you talk about that mix in your assortment and how you find that balance? Yeah, so we, we launched our signature line about um, a little over a year ago now, um, and we're constantly growing it. I think so this is something I didn't mention when you talked about like where we see our, our um, company in five years and like kind of the mix, um, but we, there's obviously like a lot of benefits to controlling the supply chain, controlling the, the fit, um, when you do your design in house, you can also like work on margins and better utilize fabrics and all that kind of stuff. So we're right now, it's still a relatively small percentage of our business that's proprietary design, um, but it's growing every quarter and it's something that we're really focused on building out. Um, and so your question was like, how do we find the mix? And I think like, like anything in retail, you have to look to the customer and let her kind of tell you like where you're where you're hitting and where you aren't. So for us, we're kind of like we're it's still a new business for us. So we're kind of in that stage where we're learning like what we're doing well, what we still need to work on versus the market. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you, do you think you'll maintain um, both sides of the supply chain? I think so, because it gives us flexibility to um, to move quickly and to react to where the business is going. Um, I, I also think like part of what is so cool about <coughs> mod cloth and like part of what we stand for is like being able to bring our customers cool independent brands and like unique product that you wouldn't find anywhere else. So I always want that to be part of the experience as well. Yes. Yeah. Andrew. So, Andrew Alhorst, uh first year here at Pepper as well, Hi. and then newly minted Schwartz Fellow. Um, Sweet. So, I uh, I had a question about your blog and how you use and integrate that into the customer experience and, and subsequently use it to hopefully generate sales. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. We've had our blog for, God, probably since 2006, 2007. So it's been um, a big part of how we talk to our like most committed fan base. Um, it's it's changed a lot though. I feel like in the last two to three years, like people aren't really going to blogs and like having conversations in the comments anymore. You know, it's it's really we we think about it as a way to um, kind of like add. You know, we always think about it as this mixture of content and commerce. It's a way to add more content so that she has something to come and participate in, even if she isn't shopping that day. Like we want her to come to Mod Cloth and to um, like experience the brand, even if she's like kind of between payday, right? Um, so the blog gives us the chance to do that. And where we've seen the most success in the last like year or so has really been around um, like digging into like the stories behind the products. So like we just ran a feature, or we have a feature running this week around our um, our print designer and kind of like who she is in the background and like how her job works at ModCloth. And like that's that's something that we've seen a lot of success with. Um, our customers really love that like behind the scenes look. So that's kind of how it's morphed. We look at, I think that you can look at, um, you know, direct sales through click through, but it's really like, it's more important than that. It's you have to look at the customers, the cohort of customers that interact with the blog and kind of like what their lifetime value looks like to truly get an idea of um, like where the where the real value is in investing that time. Because it is, you know, it's, it's time and resources that you're not spending in other places. Um, so whenever possible, we try to make that content that's coming through the blog, like content that we can use through other social channels, through other places. Um, I think more so now than probably like five years ago where we were creating a lot of content that was just for that space. Okay. 
Thanks. You use social yeah. media to point people there too. It gives it oh, some yeah. drop. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my name is Allison from the College. I will be moving to LA, so I will be there. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two questions. One is, can you please describe the Mark Hoff woman and sort of how in the second question is, how does the work relationship with your husband change during this process because it's not easy with your partner and it's a part of a personal and professional level and to still thrive something forward. Yeah. Um, so, Maude Cloth Woman, she's 21 to 35. She's interested in fashion. It's a big part of who she is and how she expresses herself to the outside world. Um, she is super smart. Um, we find that our customers generally are like have multiple degrees and are, you know, when we look at like the Comcast, like qual score type stuff, like she like ha is more likely to have a graduate degree and like all these wow. cool things. Um, I think like at the core, it's like she really appreciates self-expression and unique feminine fashion. So it sounds like the empathy map we just did in class, doesn't it? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, when, so the question about what it's like to work with your partner. Um, and I should say, Eric, actually, he left the business about a year and a half ago now. Um, we brought in a like professional retail CEO um, who has, yeah, he has, comes from like eight years of experience in Urban Outfitters. He's had a lot of experience in growing brick and mortar, which is really important to us. Um, we worked with our board to interview and find him. And it's been, that's probably like a whole other case study and like story, um, like how to bring in, especially as with a founder CEO, as the founder CEO transitions out and you bring in a new CEO. Um, it doesn't but it's always been, work. I've been in the middle of that, yeah. And it's, it's been a really, it's been a great learning for me. Um, but it's, yeah, it's been the first time that we've not, been working together. Um, I think for any founding partnership, like it's really important that you never want the other person's job. <laughs> and I think that was like always really key for us. Um, like we had a really clear division of labor and we'd always like, we we're always there to bounce ideas off of, but at the end of the day, like it was always really clear who was the ultimate decision maker. Um, and I think that's super important for if you're working with a family member or with a, a spouse um, or, you know, like, yeah, right. partner, significant other. Um, but I think for, for any sort of, <laughs> for any sort of founder partnership, um, I think it's also really important that you kind of sit down and have the conversation around like, okay, if this is, if it doesn't work, like, do we like where do we hit the line where we say like we put our relationship first and we step away from it um, so that was always a conversation that we'd like come back to and talk about um, yeah I, let's see how that point it's, about not wanting each other's jobs really important and that's yeah. that ongoing conversation you yeah. always always have to talk about that um, you described what Eric was doing now earlier. I love that term. <laughs> yeah, my husband is, um, it, the term we've been using is fun employed. <laughs> He's been yeah, consulting with startups and kind of helping us. We just moved and we're doing all sorts of personal stuff, but yeah, he's kind of in between things right now. Right. Fun employed, that's like, it's a dream though. Yeah, it is. It's it nice. Is. But it doesn't last long. <laughs> yeah. so, it definitely so, won't. I, we always tell our students, you know, picking your co-founder is at least as important as picking your, you know, partner in life. Right? Oh, absolutely. Because you actually spend a lot more time You're... <laughs> with your co-founder than you do your spouse. You got the best of both worlds. Yep. But, you know, so. Yeah, I honestly, I don't know how we would have, when I think back to, especially the, like the first, three, four years. I don't know how we would have had other relationships right. if we weren't yeah. like also together. Um, it's, it's just, it is a lot of work. Married it's a lot job, of time. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You talked about 600% growth in the beginning stages of your company. How do you manage that kind of scale? Especially with cash, you have to reinvest inventory. Your company's growing exponentially. You're investing in the team. So how do you manage that without the company kind of like flying apart? I think it is all about the people. Um, I think when you're in that level of growth, it's so important to find the right people that can help you and like to really um, keep a handle on everyone that you're bringing into the business. 
Um, that was, yeah, we had a year where I think we hired like 90 people in a year. Um, be, making sure that you're like part of those hiring processes, that you're taking the time to um, like kind of codify some of the, the things that are just like natural in the culture that when you expand that quickly, like you can't just expect it to like to happen by osmosis. You have to like sit down and like be very strategic and planful. Um, and yeah, you just, you do your best, right? And I don't, I'm sure we made plenty of mistakes during that time too, yeah. but it's like, hopefully you, um, you do enough things right that they, yeah. and you learn from the mistakes and hopefully just, you'll still make mistakes, but you don't make the same ones. I always say you make more mistakes than you make right decisions, but the right decisions hopefully have a lot more impact, right? That's yeah. a good way to put it. And I know this, it's like a really general answer. Um, so hopefully that's useful in some way, but yeah, it's, you really do just have to, it, it, everything comes down to the people that you have. So I think like during that time, like spending, it's, it's easy to kind of um, step back and like not invest the time in each, in each person and in each, in really thinking critically through each hire, but you, you have to. And you, you were distributed. You were LA, yeah. San Francisco, and Pittsburgh. That's hard. Rob, you had a question? Yeah, so obviously you need to watch sales and how your company's performing, but as an e-commerce company and particularly one in the fashion industry, what are the leading indicators you watch closely to help you know where to spend your time? Continue on your trajectory or something? We're always looking at um, new visits, new customers, um, and we're always looking at our conversion rates. So those are like the three big KPIs that we're I'm looking at every single day um, across the company. We also spend a lot of time looking at our customer cohorts. So if, um, you know, looking at our 30, 60, 90, and kind of in perpetuity customer lifetime values. Um, so we're like always thinking about, because it's not just about getting traffic and getting new visits and new customers, but it's about how valuable those customers are and how valuable they will be. Um, so we're always looking at those uh, cohorts and how they change over time to let us know if we're if our marketing efforts are are actually succeeding. Bob, uh, what strategies do you use to re-engage those customers um, after they purchased from you once? So it's a really interesting question because there's a lot of like straightforward stuff like you know CRM like uh, sending like very specific email campaigns and that kind of thing. I think that it's, um, it, there is, there's like all that kind of tangible stuff that you can track, but then there's the intangible of uh, like making sure that your customer care experience is amazing, making sure that your packaging is delightful, like just going above and beyond in any way that you can. Um, to give, to kind of break through the noise and become like not just a place where your customer's coming to like buy a commodity, but to become like a brand that she loves. And there's so many little things that go into that. Um, it's, yeah, I, I think it's like all of those things have to be, have to be right and you have to care about all of them. Um, and depending on the customer, like you don't, there could be, any one of those elements that really sticks out and that causes her to come back or that causes her to to abandon and to not come back and not participate again. Um, so it's like there are a lot of really specific tactics that we use and a lot of specific strategies, but it's at the end of the day, like everything has to be as perfect as it can be every time, every time she interacts with the brands. And that's really, that consistency is what's gonna bring customers back. It's great that you have that passion and that high bar because that has to be yeah. part of the culture. We haven't been fair to this side of the room, that's it. Hi, um, Hi. I'm Pete, and I'm a master's student in the human computer interaction program here. And I think that the thing that I'm most excited about is the first website that I bought clothes off of without having tried them on before. Oh, that's so cool. That's, that's rad. <laughs> I love I that. Could you repeat that, please? <laughs> um, a huge part of the <laughs> Mod Cloth brand is trusting the quality of the clothes and trusting 
the judgment of the community, and I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the design decisions you've made on the website um, to foster that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely em it's empowered by technology, and like we've built like our we've built our reviews, and we've built our I mean, we're right now entirely on homegrown platform, and we're on in process of switching to um, more of a, a ooh, commercial platform. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we've always had at the top of our minds, like how can we give her a voice and a chance to be, to participate and be part of it. Um, I think even more so than the technology and the design though, is the, um, that like one-on-one -on -one connection that I was talking about earlier. So it's like, it's building that trust and it is through all these like tiny interactions where, you know, like unless there is a, you know, like, really and we have you know a whole list of this but like a really offensive comment like we allow re every review through and we look at we have a person looking at every single one um, even if they're negative right and it's like you have to build that trust with your community you have to admit when you mess something up like you'll see a lot of times if someone's like left a review where you know maybe we try our best to check everything, but like maybe a button came off or we didn't, you know, this was like an item that, that made it through QC. Um, you know, like we have a team that'll go in and offer to send her a new one to like make it right. Um, all, of, all of those little micro interactions, I think are the things that come together and that really uh, create trust and create that feeling of community and that's, like I said, something that's empowered by technology, but is really driven by the people that you have and those like one-on-one -on -one connections. Yeah, that intimacy is important. And going back to the IRL, you're coming then and trying yeah. to do it at a whole new level. So I saw someone, was it? yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about the balance of uh, sort of uh, control versus growth over the course of the company from something that you kind of owned every aspect of while it was in your house in the garage um, to something where you went know, to the CEO transition, the complexity of growing it across three cities. So how do you kind of make those decisions as you go between the pieces that you own as a co-founder and the things that you hand off as you move to scale the business? Yeah, it's a great question. And at the beginning, um, the question, like I had a very simple question, which is like, what are, what are the things that I am um, that I can like pass off and that where I'm not adding as much value. And I think like at the beginning, that's always the, the question that you have to, you can't just do the things that you like doing, unfortunately. <laughs> like you, everyone has to kind of wear all the hats. Um, but you can, I think as a founder, like really be, um, you know, be ruthless almost in thinking about like where are the where are the ways that you're adding value that no one else can. Um, so I think like that's the first kind of I don't know litmus test <laughs> to use. Um, I think that you know as the company has grown and as we've hit a certain level of scale, um, I've. You know, my my personal journey as a founder is kind of like it's gone from, you know, being really ruthless about where can I add the most value and where are the the things that I can pass <coughs> off to, like where are the where are the things that I'm like most engaged with and where are the where are the things that I'm um, you know super passionate about. I think in order to continue to do to grow and to feel like engaged in the business at some point you kind of have to switch and like ask those types of questions and be um, it's like it becomes more personal there and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're that that's what you get to spend all of your time on but you're like working towards building that kind of role um, so for me I've been working towards building a role where I'm able to work on the design side of the business to work more with the product like it's the stuff that I really love getting to do um, and I think that, yeah, for, for anyone who's kind of gone through this, this like crazy journey, you have to kind of turn the corner and get to that stage where you're saying like, okay, what's the thing that I need versus what the business needs from me? Right. That's so important lesson for first time entrepreneurs is being ruthless. I call it brutal prioritization. Right? Yeah. You cannot do everything and you have to focus on where you can add value and then build a, a team to go get there. 
Yes. Um, hey, uh, Nathan Pitzer, fresh year MBA. Um, Monoclaw's done a lot, especially recently, um, not only just growing as a company, but also making a big social impact. Um, promoting a lot of positive body image seems to be something that, that you and Monoclaw are very passionate about. Do you think that's something that's it's really important to the business itself, or do you think it's, it's more, I mean, you, you want to promote this, and, and it's kind of like a hobby that goes along the side of the <laughs> I think it's definitely important to the business. Um, and it is something that I personally feel really passionately about as well. Um, just like being a, a woman in the world, like I wanna make it better for other women in the world and for like my, my sister and my niece and my friends. Um, you know, it's kinda, kinda sucks that we have all of these like crazy uh, standards pushed on us from not just the fashion industry, but from media in general. Um, but I, yeah, I do think it's something that's important for our brand as well. And we think about, um, you know, one of the core tenets of our brand being inclusivity. And like, at the end of the day, like we want to help our customers feel like the best versions of themselves. And we do that through the product assortment that we bring to her, but we also do it through, you know, creating an environment and a community and like having conversations that are, um, that are relevant to her, not just in her experience at ModCloth, but in the way that she's interacting with the world and with um, kind of fashion at large. Um, and I, so I do think like for, like for any kind of brand that wants to become more than just a place to come and like kind of interact and buy, you know, let's, like fashion's not commodity, but you could say some of it maybe is. Um, we do all have to get dressed, right? Um, but like, if you want to create a deeper, like emotional connection, create a brand that people really love, like you do need to, you need to have something that's there, something more there. Um, and I think that those, those types of conversations um, that we have with our customers and in the bigger fashion world allow us to, to create that deeper emotional connection. And that's kind of like the community that you were talking about building around the yeah. product rather than just the product itself. Yeah. This has been amazing, Susan. You've been wonderful. Unfortunately, we have a time box. So I have one <laughs> last question that I ask any speaker that comes to CMU. Okay. And if you could only give one piece of advice, limited <laughs> to one, there's many that you could give to these aspiring entrepreneurs out there, what would that one piece of advice be? Ooh. Um, I think it's enjoy the ride. Like when I look back on kind of the, I was, I used the roller coaster metaphor. It's, it's crazy and it won't always be fun. Sometimes it is really scary. But when I look back, I feel like, and this is something I remind myself all the time, I need to be like present and enjoying it. Yeah. Cause it's, it's not about the destination. Like you have to be, so you have to be enjoying it while you're, I know I'm, I'm getting into all sorts of cliches. No, now. <laughs> so, it's because they, but they're, they're true, right? Yeah. You kind of, right? you kind of have to, I feel like when I was starting out, like I, I had this, I didn't really have like, it's like, oh, maybe we'll be, you know, there'll be this like moment where it'll be done and I'll be successful. Right, and that that moment doesn't come. It's all about enjoying what what you're doing. You are successful. That's yeah. a part of the ride. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, but there's not like a moment where it's like, oh, I have it all figured out now, and it's it's done. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's give Susan a great big round of applause. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, again, I apologize. We could be here all afternoon, but we have to clear the room for the next class.